8 Controversial Banned Songs Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to discuss 8 Controversial Banned Songs. More specifically, we'll investigate the political motivations and explicit themes that got these songs banned. It's interesting to look at music as a way of tracking a society's ethics throughout the decades and in different places. Because taking offence to something is entirely subjective, public interest and censor groups will often step in to control thoughts that deviate too far from the mainstream. Music, however, a medium that thrives on self-expression, often highlights the hypocrisy in Western cultures between censorship and a supposed love of free speech. Let's look at eight rebellious songs songs that made people clutch at their pearls in shock. By the way, a word of warning, some of this content may be unsuitable for children. Number 1. God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols brought punk music to the forefront in 1977 Britain, upsetting the public order with lyrics that painted the Queen's reign as a fascist regime, and all of this during the Queen's Silver Jubilee, marking 25 years since Queen Elizabeth II ascended to the throne. With lyrics like, God save the Queen, she's not a human being, and there's no future and England's dreaming, there were soon furors that led to the BBC banning the song from public broadcast. Unquestionably, the band's manager, Malcolm McLaren, knew exactly what he was doing. The band signed their record deal outside Buckingham Palace, the album cover provoked outrage as the Queen's face was covered, redacted even, by newspaper clippings, and just to drive the countercultural message home, the Sex Pistols parodied the Queen's celebrations by performing a gig on a boat that floated past the House of Commons just two days before the Queen herself would for her Jubilee celebrations. Sex Pistols lead singer John Lydon, stage name Johnny Rodden, didn't intend the song to be taken so seriously. As he puts it, these are fun songs, done for a laugh. God Save the Queen, it's kind of high camp in a way. Number 2. Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke, featuring Pharrell Williams and T.I., was the hit song of 2013. Its catchy, upbeat tune was impossible to escape. Unless, of course, you went to one of around 20 universities in the UK, such as the University of Derby or the University of West Scotland. The student unions of the universities claimed that the lyrics of the song, and in fact the very title itself, promoted the degradation of women and perpetuated the myth that consent was a grey area. It's not hard to see where they got this impression, with the lyrics like, I know you want it, you're a good girl. It certainly didn't help that the music video followed a similar line of thinking, with half-naked women parading around in front of Thick. In fact, this new Nudity got the original video banned from YouTube, not surprisingly. Couple the song with some sleazy interviews with Thick himself, and a raunchy twerking appearance with Miley Cyrus at the 2013 VMAs, and you create a song that has lodged itself in the lower intestine of history. This song keeps on giving, however, as a lawsuit was soon filed against Thick, claiming that he had ripped off the Marvin Gaye song, Got to Give It Up. After legal back and forth, Thick and Williams eventually lost the suit, and paid $7.3 million to Marvin Gaye's estate. Number 3. Cop Killer by Body Count, Ice-T's rock band formed in the early 90s, released just prior to the 1992 LA riots, and as such faced considerable backlash from groups in support of the police. The LA riots consisted of robberies, arsons, assaults, and even murders that occurred in response to the acquittal of four police officers that had used excessive force in the arrest of black citizen Rodney King. This was the match that ignited the powder keg of racially motivated police brutality that locals had known to be going on for years. Ice-T was no stranger to this fact, and his song Cop Killer aimed to address the issue. However, the specific story of Cop Killer, as you may have guessed from the name, wasn't exactly the nicest solution to the problem. The character in the song wants to kill any cops who have committed police brutality, with lyrics like, Cop Killer, better you than me, and I'm about to kill me something, a pig just stopped me for nothing. Ice-T claimed the song wasn't about inciting violence, but rather expressing the frustrations of his community. Despite his firm belief that the song should be released, Ice-T decided to pull the song from the album when physical threats were being made to employees at Time Warner, the owners of his record label. As one last middle finger to his critics, Ice-T replaced the song with another of his songs, titled Freedom of Speech. Number 4. The Pill by Loretta Lynn is a 1975 country song that somewhat comically approaches the use of the birth control pill to stop having children. Of course, in its time, birth control was still a taboo topic to discuss, as it had only been introduced in 1960, and country music was regarded as something of a wholesome genre. This couldn't be further from the truth, however, with many songs covering topics like casual adultery and excessive drinking, such as Harper Valley PTA and The Lord Knows I'm Drinking. Perhaps what was more worrying to the country music stations that banned the pill was the idea of women discussing sexuality in an open forum. Topics such as menstruation and abortion were similarly abhorrent to country music stations that instead preferred to keep these kinds of real issues under wraps. 
Despite their bans, Lin Song still reached number 5 in the country music charts, and is looked back upon as one of the defining turning points in country music content. Number 5 Many songs have been banned based on sexually explicit lyrics, including Lady Gaga's Love Game with that infamous lyric, I wanna take a ride on your disco stick, and Britney Spears' not so subtle If You Seek Amy. I said, if you seek Amy. Get your mind out of the gutter. But whilst these raunchy songs raised some eyebrows even in the 21st century, imagine being that sexually explicit back in 1975. Love to Love You Baby by Donna Summers began a long line of women blatantly flaunting their sexuality to sell records. The song's lyrics weren't so bad, but the passionate moaning in between was enough to get the song banned by radio stations in the US and the BBC. You may think I'm exaggerating, but the song literally includes a 23 second fake orgasm. Time Magazine perhaps has my favourite account of the song. They count 22 orgasms, call the song Sex Rock, and state Donna's message is best conveyed in grunts and groans and languishing moans. Summers herself has since said that she regrets the song, as it was her breakout hit and painted her as a sex-obsessed seductress for most of her career. The song's popularity was apparent, however, appearing in the film Saturday Night Fever and cementing Summer's place as a disco diva. Number 6 Another common reason to take songs off the air is when their subject matter may be considered offensive during times of war. Some of these decisions are easier to make than others, like banning Why by Jadakiss for lyrics suggesting that George W. Bush was behind the 9-11 attacks. Other censorships are less logical, like when the BBC banned Six Months in a Leaky Boat by Split Ends because it was thought to be connected to the Falklands War, in which Britain attempted to reclaim the Falkland Islands from invading Argentinian forces. And sometimes just a single word is enough to get a song banned, like when Light My Fire by The Doors was taken off the air during the Gulf War just because it had the word fire in it. For this spot on the list, however, I think it has to go to the 1981 Phil Collins song, In The Air Tonight. The song was first banned in 1991 during the Gulf War, presumably because the title is slightly ominous, I suppose. It wasn't alone. The BBC banned 66 other songs during the conflict as well. You can bet the song didn't stand a chance following 9-11 banned again from broadcast on most radio stations. Thankfully, the song was brought back to prominence by the gorilla playing the drums in that Cadbury ad. Number 7 Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday tackles by far one of the most confronting issues in American history, the lynching of African Americans in the South. Performed by Holiday in 1939, the song started out as a poem written by Jewish teacher Abel Mirapol. Mirapol was driven to write the poem after viewing a famous and disturbing picture in which black youths Abram Smith and Thomas Shipp were hung by a white group who had lynched them in prison. Mirapol set his poem to music and passed it to a cabaret club where one of their performers, Holiday, sang Strange Fruit for her audience. Holiday recalls there wasn't even a patter of applause. Then everyone began to clap. It's no surprise that Holiday's audience was so shocked at first. The song was packed with stark imagery that juxtaposed the calm serenity and charm of the South with the quiet of the dead, the silence of those too oppressed to speak out or fight back. Lines like black bodies swinging in the southern breeze and scent of magnolias sweet and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh shook people to their core. It's not surprising, however, that these lyrics got the song banned from most radio stations, for fear of prompting civil unrest. But Holiday and Mirapol's message was heard. Numerous other artists have covered or referenced Strange Fruit, including Diana Ross, Nina Simone, and even Kanye West, who sampled Nina Simone's version in his track Blood on the Leaves. Number 8 of course, when it isn't moral outrage or sensitivity to sexuality, there's always one last reason to ban a song. Because it'll cost you money if you don't. And the flip side is that a damn good reason to make music can often be to make money. In the 80s, the commercialization of music reached fever pitch, using creativity to turn a profit rather than to make a point. Rock star Neil Young exposed these sellouts in his 1988 song, This Note's For You. In the song, Young asserts that he ain't singing for Pepsi, ain't singing for Coke. I don't sing for nobody makes me look like a joke. The song's video clip was even bolder, parodying famous ads at the time including Eric Clapton's Michelob ad and the famous Michael Jackson Pepsi commercial where he accidentally set his hair on fire. Unsurprisingly, this sparked complaints from Jackson himself, along with other supposed sellouts like Whitney Houston. 
MTV was at the height of its popularity at the time, but the decision was made not to air Young Song because it contained references to commercial products and likenesses of real celebrities. This rule had been put in place to prevent companies selling their products through the music station, gunking up the channel with advertisements. Young and his manager Elliot Roberts both suspected, however, that this was merely an excuse to save MTV from losing sponsors, the ban itself proving that Young Song was right. After all, MTV still had Weird Al's song, Fat, a parody of Michael Jackson's song, Bad. Personally, I'm not a huge fan of censorship. I believe that every opinion should be heard, and that satirical or poignant music can be a great motivating force for change. But surely there's gotta be a line somewhere, right? Surely some music must be entirely controversial without any real substance, and doesn't deserve airtime. But perhaps that decision is best made by the listening public, rather than corporations or interest groups. Then again, this whole episode has almost made me forget that music is supposed to be fun. I'm gonna blast some Jamiroquai and put all this political nonsense out of my mind for a bit. See you all next week. If you enjoy what we do here at Culture Crash, please consider supporting the show via our Patreon, where we have a bunch of awesome rewards, or by checking out our online store. All links are in the description below.